great pleasure to be here, and it's, it's really wonderful to see this many people here. I've sent people from my various teams to cover the, the, uh, the Women's Forum, but it's my first time being here. And as I look around the room, I see a lot of people tapping away at, um, at small computers and smartphones and that sort of thing. So it's hard to remember back to the time when we weren't connected. And that's essentially the beginning of, of what we're going to be talking about today with, uh, with the sharing economy. I'd just like to see how many people here have not used Uber. Who has not? Just raise your hands. Who hasn't used Uber? Well, let's just say it's about a third of you. OK. How about Airbnb? Who has not ever used Airbnb? OK. There's still hope for the, the old economy. The point is. <laughs> We, we all use, we all buy everything online. We're all consumers online. We always have been, and it's really great. And now we can sell our own stuff online, and we're, we're making all these deals, and, and we're connected. But are we a community? Is there not a little bit of a downside to the, the gig economy, the, the connected economy? Does it, does it perhaps reflect a little bit of a negative side of the, of, of the world economy, of the state of affairs, of, of how all of this change has been disruptive? But beyond that, um, what does it mean for, for women? Certainly, it's, you don't need a lot of capital. You need a little bit of, uh, of computer smarts. You don't even have to leave the house or push around any large bundles of things. So it's, there's a lot of opportunities from that level. But to give us an idea of, of actually what's going to be going on with the, uh, with the, the sharing economy, we have quite a, a, nice, a nice panel of, of experts here. So I'm going to introduce them now and call them up. Benita Matowska is the founder and chief sharer of the People Who Share, which is a social enterprise that helps people and companies discover the sharing economy. Benita, do you want to come up? She's won many awards for her efforts, including the NatWest Venus Entrepreneur of the Year Award. She's an RSA fellow, um, a former BBC TV executive and media entrepreneur. She's presented at major conferences, and, and now she's with us. So thank you very much. Next, Gianna Eckert. She is a professor of marketing at Royal Holloway University of London. She teaches global, come on up. She teaches global marketing uh, and brand management to um, MBA and executive MBA students. Um, she's been a member of Suffolk University in Boston. Uh, she received her, her Bachelor of Science in Marketing from the University of Connecticut, PhD in Marketing from University of Minnesota. She's widely published uh, and does quite a bit of research, particularly in changes in consumer behavior. So we're very happy to have you with us as well. Uh, next, from Canada, um, Monique LaRue, who is president of the International Cooperative Alliance, chair of the high-level contact group of the European Association of Cooperative Banks, and former chairman of the board, president, and CEO of the Desjardins Group. Um, she is also chairs of the um, high-level contact group of the European Associate, Association of Cooperative Banks. She's ex uh, extraordinarily involved in, uh, in the uh, affairs of, of Quebec, where she chairs the board of Investissement, and she's chair of the Quebec Economic and Innovation Council, and a very long list of other accolades, which would take us to the end of this session if I were to go through them all, so forgive me on that one. And then finally, We've heard of the token woman, now we have a token man, and he's quite a man. <laughs> Denny Duvern, we're very pleased to have you with us. He's the chairman of the board of, uh, of directors of AXA, a post he's held since September 1st of this year, the culmination of 20 years with the world's leading financial institution. He, um, he is a graduate of the prestigious French business school, HSA, and the Ecole Nationale d'Administration. He has a strong background uh, with the Ministry of Finance in France, and he has uh, also is a member of the Private Sector Advisory Group, which is co-funded by the World Bank and the OECD to bring together international leaders of the private sector to help developing countries improve their corporate governance. So, Thank you all for, for being with us. Um, we're we're going to start with some opening comments. And um, in talking with everybody, I came up with a couple of questions that I think will, will help uh, to start. So let me just find those. We're, we'll start with you, um, Benita. Can you define for us what the sharing economy is and perhaps what it is not? 
So the sharing economy is in fact widely misunderstood and I can probably guess that most of the people in this room have very different opinions about what the sharing economy is or might be. So just to set the record straight, and I'm feeling very guilty at having my back towards some people, so I'm going to keep turning around. Um, so the sharing economy is in fact a socio-economic system built around the sharing of human and physical resources. So human and physical resources, that could include skills and knowledge, it could include goods, it could include jobs, services, um, cars, we've heard already mentioned, property, housing, food, um, all of the necessities of life, in fact. And very much the sharing economy is about building a society based around sharing. That's ultimately what this is about. So the sharing in the sharing economy, what does that mean? Because often this is the part that's the most misunderstood. So the sharing in the sharing economy refers to different types of sharing. So in the case of renting, it's referring to accessing a shared resource. In the case of collaborating, it's referring to how we work together, how we operate and cooperate with other people, how we share that space. So different types of sharing. You hear terms like rent, lend, borrow, swap. All of these terms refer to different types of sharing. Because the sharing economy is a hybrid economy. So it's not necessarily free, but what's happening is we're having different forms of value exchange. And of course, in the sharing economy, it has tripart value. So there's economic value, there's social value, and there's environmental value. And actually, when you start to look at what are the drivers behind the sharing economy, we know that... So last year, I authored a report called What We Know About the Global Sharing Economy. And essentially, what we did was aggregated all of the data that was available to us at that time from around the world into a single report so that we could get an idea of what was happening in this space, the scale of what we were talking about, who's participating, why are they participating, how many people are participating, um, and what does this mean for society at large. And you know, what we found were, in terms of drivers, the first time that someone engages in the sharing economy, and by the way, 28% of the global population are already participating in some form or another. Now, people may not call it the sharing economy, but when you ask them specifically about the activities they're doing, in fact, we're all part of the sharing economy, even if we don't know it. So 28% part participating, and actually the primary reason why people first engage in the sharing economy is an economic driver. So there's the need to make money or to save money. That could be for ourselves, our families, our communities, but that's the, the first driver. But the reason that people come back to the sharing economy is because of the other value that it creates, the social value and the environmental value. So that could, for example, be about the experience that you have. You have a particular experience that is so unique and special that you want to come and do this again because it's not the kind of experience you're going to get perhaps in a traditional transaction. This could also be because you connect with other human beings because to share is to be human. All of us have a desire and a capacity, an unlimited capacity, actually, to share. So we live on a planet of finite resources, but our potential to share is unlimited. And I believe, very passionately, that actually what's wrong with the world is that there's a shortage of sharing and that we can fix that because if we can unleash our collective capacity to share and collaborate, then actually we can create and build this better world. And this is not some kind of pipe dream because already, as I mentioned, 28% of the global participation, people participating. But also what we're seeing is that you know, when some of the economists and companies like PwC have started to look at the growth of this sector, we're seeing huge valuations. We know from our own research, the market is growing um, faster than Facebook, Google, and Yahoo combined. PwC's recent report shows the market is growing 20 times faster than they had predicted in 2014. So huge growth in the sector. Now, I believe that as leaders, as citizens, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to look at the potential of the sharing economy and say, how can we create and build and develop that? There are issues, there are challenges that have not yet been solved. 
There are issues around um, different classification of employment. Um, we're talking about creative, a, creating a new paradigm. And I believe that as leaders and as citizens, we have a responsibility to be positive about that and create this new paradigm that we seek to build. Because there is a reason that we've had these very significant um, political events happen. And it's because large swathes of the global population are not happy with the status quo. And actually, because we haven't had the kind of leadership that we need, people are making what I believe are very poor choices, but they're making them because they are not happy with the status quo. So from the perspective of the sharing economy, that is an opportunity for us to build a better society and a sharing society and a sharing economy. And I believe we have a responsibility to do that. And rather than looking at perhaps some of the negatives of the sharing economy, we need to build this new paradigm and not focus on fear and negativity because we can all find holes in everything. Nothing's perfect, right? But also nothing can't be solved. So whatever the challenges we are facing in the sharing economy, I believe those are problems that are challenges that have yet to be solved. And that's my, I guess my big message is we need to understand it's a very, very broad spectrum. We hear terms like the circular economy, collaborative economy. We hear about cooperatives. I know we're going to be hearing more about that. And these are all aspects of a very broad spectrum that is the sharing economy. But ultimately, it's about building a sustainable economy that puts people and planet at its heart. And I believe that's the responsibility that we have, not just to women, but to the world at large. Thank you. Thank you, Benita. So one of the questions that we'll be addressing as well is some of the people who have been, whose industries have been disrupted by the sharing economy need to be somehow included as we go forward. So, Gianna, your recent HBR article looked at the downside of the sharing economy, and I don't want to be doom and gloom here, but um, your, the changes it's brought are not all positive. Um, can you elaborate a little bit, and how do we include these people who have been disrupted out of a job? Sure. So I've been doing research in the sharing economy for about the past five years, and uh, one of the, the, the main findings that comes out of it is that the sharing economy really is not about sharing. And I say that from the consumer perspective, um, in the sense that while there's been a huge uptake, uh, as Benita mentioned, in participation in these new business models, and people love it, it's for reasons that aren't necessarily about collaborating with each other or sharing with each other. And so I think it's important that we use the right terms. So the term that I tend to use uh, is the access economy. Because I think consumers want to have access to uh, resources uh, in, uh, and not necessarily own them. I think they're looking to have freedom and flexibility from the burdens of ownership, um, but not necessarily engage in sharing. So one of the key uh, things to understand in this is the difference between social exchange and economic exchange. So in social exchange, um, there are reciprocal obligations that come when you don't engage in um, an economic exchange. So for example, if you stay over at someone's house, not because you used Airbnb, but because they're your friend, you will give, bring them a bottle of wine, for example, uh, when you arrive. And that's the type of exchange that happens. Um, in genuine sharing in that way. With economic exchange, when using something like Airbnb, where you there is a market mediation, and so you pay for staying in someone's home before you arrive, those types of obligations are not there. Um, and so when you have this, this market mediation is actually preferred by consumers within the sharing economy. Um, and to just give you a couple examples of this, um, Couchsurfing, if you guys know that uh, organization, is oftentimes talked about as being genuine sharing in comparison to Airbnb, for example, which is economic exchange, as I mentioned. Um, but Couchsurfing, just about three or four months ago, has changed their model. So you now do need to pay to be a member. You don't pay for each time that you stay at someone's home, but it's now a membership model rather than free. And consumers really want this um, economic exchange because it provides a way for them to overcome the trust issue that you have when you engage with anonymous others or strangers in the terms that we heard before. Um, so consumers want organizations to provide um, 
these, these mechanisms that help them gain that trust. So the best example of this tends to be rating systems, right? If you think about rating your Uber driver or rating the person who has hosted you on Airbnb, looking at their ratings is what gives consumers this um, confidence to be able to, to trust these anonymous others. Um, and, but in some cases, it's very difficult to overcome trust. So a startup that I was working with in London um, were called Etro. And I don't know if you know this, but the UK has one of the highest rates of food waste in the world. And this startup was meant to address food waste in the sense that if you are a person who has made extra food, instead of throwing it away, why not make it available to your neighbors? And for, for their part, if they're too busy to cook that evening, instead of stopping and getting a takeout from somewhere, why not get a home-cooked meal instead, which will perhaps taste better, et cetera. But because of this issue that you don't know exactly what the conditions are in the kitchen in which your neighbor has made this food, <laughs> or whether they've sneezed on it or whatever might have happened, even though, even using rating systems and things like that, they were not able to, to overcome this barrier. So it ended up morphing into a very successful company now, which is called One Fine Meal. But the model is a professional chef is making the food in a professional kitchen kitchen and you as the consumer can order it on your way home so you do get a freshly cooked meal but is it addressing the issue of food waste not so much anymore so there in some cases it's very difficult to overcome this trust issue even with the market mediation that I've been talking about as being important um, so I think, so this idea about being free from um, obligations is, is uh, as a main driver of participating in the sharing economy is quite important, I think. So this idea about having flexibility and having freedom. So using a, a bike in a bike sharing program rather than owning your own bike means that you don't have to have a place to store your bicycle. It means that you don't have to worry about the upkeep and the maintenance of your bicycle. And these types of motivations are really strong drivers. And so I think what my research shows I don't think is necessarily negative about the sharing economy, but the way that I like to look at it is it's more realistic. So having people um, participate in bike sharing programs to a higher degree is better for the environment and it has a lot of the types of um, uh, outcomes that we would like to see, but understanding the actual drivers behind why people want to do that and catering to that um, I think will ultimately increase, uh, increase participation. Um, and so the, the final point I would make is that consumer behavior really tends to differ within the sharing economy compared to what we know about consumer behavior in an ownership context, for example. Um, so you see things like, um, for example, not necessarily wanting to be a part of a brand community. So a lot of the research I've, I've done has been with Zipcar, which is the largest car sharing company in the world, very similar to Blah Blah Car, which you guys might be a little more familiar with. Um, but they engaged in a lot of best practices about trying to have the people who are using the system get to know each other. Because the way the system works, similar to Blah Blah Car, is that one person has to bring it back on time in order for the next person to make sure that they get it on time, right? And that it's filled with gas. And the company is not uh, intervening in terms of the maintenance of the car in between when people have reserved it. So there are a couple different ways to try and, to try and incentivize people to behave in ways uh, which will make the whole system run well. And so they thought that trying to establish a sense of community, so in other words, having this interpersonal trust between people would be a way to do this. So in other words, you would feel social obligations to the other people within the system as to why you should bring it back on time, why you shouldn't leave your garbage in the back of the car, et cetera. Um, but to make a long story short, that really didn't work at all. And what the, the people, the consumers within the system wanted was the zip car itself to engage in the governance. They wanted everyone to be monitored. They wanted texts to be sent in five minute intervals to make sure people got back on time. They wanted people to be fined if they left um, uh, garbage in the car, for example. And once they implemented sort of what we call this big, this big brother style of uh, governance, if you will, the whole system ran a lot better and people were much more pleased with it. So again, I see this as an example of if you understand what the drivers are for participation within the sharing economy from a more realistic perspective, it will increase the actual usage of it to, uh, to a larger degree. And maybe increase some jobs for monitors to fix the garbage in the back seat. Yes. <laughs>
Monique co-ops have been around for a long time. I think of them kind of in the 1950s in New York City, for example. Um, maybe, maybe they were a precursor to today's sharing economy. What is the role between the two? Dans un premier temps, je vais me permettre de saluer en français. First of all, uh, I'm going to use French. I have several colleagues here. So I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Clara and, and uh, Jacqueline for their excellent work. Uh, really, this is a wonderful forum, so very uh, wide. So observations that I would like uh, to share before going into the co-op uh, sector is that the way I see the um, uh, collaborative or sharing economy is overall very positive uh, because it open uh, new uh, ways of doing business. First of all, you eliminate uh, what I call sometimes unnecessary intermediaries. So you connect directly consumers, producer, service providers together in a way that is, well, very efficient. Second, uh, what you are able to do is you are able to leverage your assets uh, in a way that frankly speaking, bring a lot of innovation. There is a downside because some of those big organizations very successful in the collaborative economy at this point in time, they are externalizing the risk and responsibilities regarding the service providers, quote, quote, the employees, or the uh, risk uh, associated with uh, the assets. So there is an issue there, and that's why I think that the co-op could be a very interesting uh, solution. But what also is very interesting about the sharing economy is the fact that with technology, they have, many of them, an immediate connection with, in fact, users around the world, and they have a global reach. So there are a lot of positive aspects in, into the sharing economy in terms of the agility, the efficiency, the connection to needs of people. But we need to find a way, I think, from a public policy point of view, to find solutions to make sure that the value created by this new business models will be better shared among the different participants into a particular project. And that's where the co-op model is an interesting model. And you are so right, Shelley, because it's an old-fashioned model. You know, when you think about co-op, many of you will have a reaction, oh, what a boring business model. But it is not, when you think about it. Um, just a few uh, numbers for some of you who do not have a good understanding of what it represents. So we are talking about 3 million businesses around the world. We are talking about roughly 1 billion members and users of co-ops. You are talking about roughly 250 million jobs uh, associated to co-ops. And if I were to take a, a turnover in number, it would be 3,000 billion US dollars a year. So if you put that into the size of an economy, it would position the cooperative movement as being among the top 10 economies in the world. And they are active in a variety of sectors, more than 100 countries, uh, from energy to consumer, from banking to insurance, and so forth. So it's a very, the difficulty with that model that you know, exists for quite a long time, and there are some very important organizations, and you have in France in particular, very large co-op organizations like Crédit Agricole and, and, and other is the fact that the business model is very flexible and adaptable. And in that context, sometimes very difficult to understand by governments and very difficult to understand by regulators. So basic principles that could help into building a robust, sustainable sharing economy. First of all, cooperative are member-owned organization. And they are, they are people-based organization. So it's not based on capital, it is based on people. So if you want to have, uh, you know, just for you to remember, the basic rule is that if you are one person, you will be having one vote into that collective organization. So that's a very powerful way to deal with human issues that are sometimes associated with the, uh, I would say, the excesses of some of those uh, 
organization like Uber and, and so forth. So from a public policy point of view, I think it's a very useful tool. What is good also, and there are different models, um, uh, you can share with the cooperative model the benefits of the value created by the overall business. You can share the overall earnings in a way that is more in line with the capacity of the different producer to be involved into that organization. So there are a lot of benefits. Now, I would conclude saying that it is also a challenge for the co-op movement to live up to this big opportunity. And the reason is very simple, is that most of those organizations are sometimes very local, and in the sharing economy, you need to have some sort of global reach. Second, you need to be very innovative, and you need to be, you need to be very technological savvy in order to have that kind of, of momentum that some of the Uber and Airbnb uh, organization have. And in that context, maybe uh, the uh, one uh, vote, one person kind of basic principle of cooperative uh, sometimes create a challenge because sometimes it takes more time to make a decision. On the other end, uh, it's very sustainable and very resilient. So I will conclude saying that in my view, it's not the only tool that can be put forward in order to deal with uh, this new sharing collaborative economy, but uh, it has to be put uh, on the table, certainly. And uh, we need uh, to uh, find a way to have a better understanding of that business model that, frankly speaking, is not uh, discussed or presented in business school. So uh, I think that we have a lot of work to do. And by the way, a lot of women in some countries are very active and are leading cooperative organizations. So it brings an interesting space there. It's a very positive note too. Yeah, so that's good. right. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Monique Lurie. Denis Duverne, you are the practitioner here. Um, and, and I guess you could say really that insurance is kind of, I mean, you share the risk, so you've got experience of that. But what opportunities uh, are, do you see for AXA and for the insurance business in general in the, in the sharing economy? How does it all fit together for you? Uh, well, first, uh, as you said, uh, insurance is probably the oldest form of sharing economy because uh, as insurers, we share risk. Uh, in traditional societies, uh, insurance was uh, uh, between members of a family or between the members of a small village. But with the Industrial Revolution, uh, people uh, relied on insurers or created insurance mutuals originally to share those risks among themselves, uh, to protect themselves against the, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> all the uh, natural events and other events that can uh, happen to, uh, to their business. Uh, so modern insurance took off with the Industrial Revolution. What insurance brings is pooling on one hand, creating large communities that uh, aggregate different types of risks, and mutualization, linking the misfortune of uh, a few with the uh, fortune of many. Uh, so insurance creates uh, an invisible net of solidarity across uh, society at large, which is it's, it's a business that has a noble purpose. Uh, and so we like to, uh, to, to do that business. But uh, over time, as the companies uh, became bigger and bigger, uh, this uh, uh, didn't turn out that well in terms of reputation. Insurance is not one of the most reputable businesses around the world. Uh, it comes just above, uh, I, would, I think, banking and uh, maybe uh, garages. Uh, so, so we are quite close to the bottom in terms of uh, image. It's not a very trusted industry. And when you look at AXA, we have 103 million customers, 7 million just in France. So you can understand that this solidarity becomes diluted. So the modern sharing economy uh, questions the fundamentals of our business because this sharing economy, in terms of uh, challenging the existing business models, uh, di disrupting the existing model business models, has started with what we call peer-to-peer -peer insurance. So what is peer-to-peer -to -peer insurance? It's... Uh, uh, small communities of people that are sharing the same interest, have the same uh, 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 risk factors, I would say, uh, bring, bring, them, bring themselves together and uh, create their own, uh, their own safety nets. So that's a disintermediation of, uh, of insurance. Uh, it questions the pooling concept because until now, 
these groups, tens of people, hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, not millions. So that's fine uh, for a minor car accident or a, a minor fire in a house. It doesn't really work for a hurricane. Uh, so uh, it questions the pooling concept. And it also questions the uh, macroeconomic role of insurance in the sense that if you take an example, which is lemonade in the US, at the end of the year, they, um, if the money has not been used, they give it back to you. Uh, when, uh, when you are in an insurance company, you are regulated. Uh, the reason you are regulated as an insurance company is that uh, the regulator wants, you, wants to make sure that you will be able to pay the last insured person in 60 or 80 years, so you need to have capital. And in fact, what happens is that this, uh, um, I would say this peer-to-peer -peer insurance uh, concept has only uh, um, set, set itself up as a, as a broker, in the form of brokerage, so they are intermediaries, but the true balance sheets that are needed to provide the safety net in case of uh, major events, we have to uh, uh, hold capital for a one in 200 year event, so it's a large amount of capital. Uh, the insurance companies are, in fact, insuring those, uh, those communities. So I guess that uh, insurance is really an enabler of the sharing economy. And I will move out of uh, just peer-to-peer -peer insurance because, in fact, the sharing economy as a whole, and you said it all, relies on trust. And uh, for the short term, you can rely on the trust of your friends and your close ones. For the long term, you, you want to rely more on the institutions. The sharing economy shifts uh, from ownership to usage and transforms the offers, and uh, it creates new forms of risk and new uh, protection needs. Uh, we are a partner to BlaBlaCar, which has been mentioned uh, on, this, uh, on this panel. Uh, we are a partner of BlaBlaCar in uh, six different countries, and <clears throat> when you are a BlaBlaCar driver, uh, or blah, blah car passenger, you have new risks you want to be insured for. <laughs> One example, in France, we insure uh, the, um, uh, the passengers and the uh, driver against the risk that the driver is very tired and wants one of the passengers to take the wheel. And depending on what policy you have, you may or may not be insured for that. We make sure that you are insured as a passenger if you take the wheel. Another risk against uh, which we protect uh, People is the fact that uh, the car may break down. We make sure that without an additional payment, you will get to, your, to, the, to the end of your journey. In Spain, we've been asked by BlaBlaCar to ensure against the risk that you lose an object in the car, you, uh, you can recover it, we'll pay it back. So this, these are new needs that are created by the sharing economy. And um, you've said very clearly that trust was a key factor, uh, and we, that th th there are new risks that are emerging. Uh, and we are the ideal partner of the sharing economy. That's how we see our role. So we see this as more an opportunity than we see this as a threat. And you can insure then like by ride. You wouldn't have to buy a policy for an entire year. You can insure just when you need it. Yes. Kind of on-demand insurance. That's, uh, that's on-demand insurance or that's uh, an insurance that is provided by Blah, blah, car, the, the, the big brother, in the, to take your words, because in that case, blah, blah, car is the, is, is the big brother. Blah, blah, car has signed a contract with AXA where those additional services are, are provided. I have an overall question, though, Denny, if I, if I may. Um, one of the ways that, that insurance companies, as I understand it, actually make sure that they have enough money in hand to insure against that once-a-century event is that you invest, and you invest long-term, and so obviously you invest from the proceeds of the different policies. If this, the sharing economy is disrupting that model a little bit, what are the potential, what's the potential impact on long-term investment and therefore on the whole economy, which maybe is why you're so far down on the food chain? <coughs> Well, uh, when I was talking about peer-to-peer -peer insurance, insure, insurance, I was saying the people that are doing that uh, are taking the position of a broker, an intermediary, in fact, are not the, uh, taking the position of the insurer regulated, having a large balance sheet and making the investments. So from that standpoint, our role has not changed and we will continue to invest, uh, invest for the long term. One point I have not... Uh, Give, uh, I've not made as an example, is the gig economy. So this, uh, this was mentioned uh, in the introduction. Uh, the, the, the sharing economy also uh, creates the opportunity of the gig economy. 
one of the issues that uh, the participants in the gig economy is, is that they are no longer sa uh, salaried employees. They don't have all the uh, protection that goes with it. And there are a number of uh, uh, startups that have uh, emerged in that field, Zenefits, uh, uh, WeMind in France, uh, and, and, and others, which are providing some coverage, the equivalent of employee benefits for non-employees, and these people go to a traditional insurer to get uh, the protection of the, of the large balance sheet. Well, uh, maybe in that context, uh, another example uh, of um, uh, things that can be done uh, to deal with those issues, and I will take, uh, if I may, a uh, co-op example. Desjardins is an example in Canada. Uh, so very close to the collaborative uh, economy. And, uh, and to a certain extent, the co-op model can be used for those kind of people. So for example, it was a, a very um, uh, imaginative and dynamic uh, co-op, which was created uh, one year ago uh, in Montreal. There was a very, uh, um, I would say, active um, video, uh, social media uh, community. And they decided to create a co-op uh, of, uh, in fact, uh, producers uh, in order to share some of the risk and get some uh, good financial uh, services uh, uh, from, uh, from Desjardins, that particular case, and also uh, insurance products. So, so what I was saying is that that vehicle that we don't think as being uh, a solution to deal with some of the issues uh, could, be, uh, could be quite, uh, you know, quite uh, promising, I think. We could take some questions from the audience, and I know that we also have some other questions we can discuss up here. So is our, does anyone have a question now? Am I missing something? I see a hand over here, if we have a microphone. Okay, a microphone should be coming. And if you could tell us your name and where you're from, please. Yes. Um, my name is Katerina Summer Wickrama. I'm from Oak Foundation in Geneva, which is a family philanthropic foundation. And we partner with a lot of um, women's organisations in the field. So we work with organisations that run cooperatives. Um, but my question is really for the first two speakers. It was very inspiring, Benita, to hear you talk about the sharing economy and then, honestly, a bit of a downer to hear it's actually an exchange economy. <laughs> And a lot of the discussion on, uh, amongst the panel was about trust. And I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name in the pink shirt. Gianna. Gianna, sorry. Um, your research seemed to be about how consumers are not trusting and we demand more regulation. But is there any research about the exchange economy, the growth of cooperatives, the growth of blah, blah, car and so forth, creating more trust? Because it seems to me if we're going to avoid some of the terrors that we talked about early of 2016, of the dislocation, separation, fragmentation, choosing isolation, we have to build trust. And are any of these new economy models, do you see, building trust so that we are more about sharing and less about an economic demand? We had, um, we had some research that we conducted early summer for Global Sharing Week, which is an initiative that we run. And this showed that trust is in fact increasing because essentially what happens is, is that when people have the experience of sharing, then actually what that does is it creates a positive experience and then therefore people want to trust more. So I guess um, the example that I'm going to give you, a realistic example of what's happening in the sharing economy. So I've been a user of these services since I was 19 years old and I did a, an auto drive away with my best friend across the US for just $30 where you transport someone else's car, a kind of early form of car sharing. And so this is how I lead my life and these are my values. And so in the summer, we had um, a family from Germany that came to uh, stay in our home. Uh, it was booked through Airbnb, and so they were paying for that. It was a transaction. Um, but what was interesting about that was that the value that was created and the trust that was created between us was not about the transaction. So, yes, um, uh, we received some money, um, which helped to offset the cost of our holiday, a low cost, because we don't want to charge a lot of money. We just want to offset the cost of our holiday. And for the family, they had an inexpensive way of coming to the UK. This was a, this was a, a mum that was travelling with her child. Now, regardless of that aspect, the transactional aspect, the value that she got 
was that her son was able to play with my son's toys. And when we came back, she left us a lovely note about how her son had played with my son's toy guitar. My son's now 11, about to be 12, and he said, well, Mummy Matt, who's four years old, he can have that guitar because I've got real guitar now that I can play. I don't need that anymore. And so we'd had this lovely correspondence, and I wrote to her, and I said, look, my son would like to give this guitar. So a friend of hers who was coming from Germany to Brighton, where I live, came and picked up the guitar and took it back to her son for his fifth birthday. Now, the two boys who are, you know, one's 11, about to be 12, and one's just turned five are now pen pals in a digital age. I think that's incredible because trust was created. We built a relationship. And this is my point. My point is that the reason the sharing economy is growing and a realistic view of the sharing economy is, is to try it. Because when you have these experiences, when you share with people, it increases that level of trust. And it's about more than a transaction. It's about that human connection, about being part of a community, and it's also about being more sustainable. And that's the reason it's growing. And uh, my, my, my you know, advice is go try it for those of you who haven't, because you will see for yourselves that's a realistic view of the sharing economy, is what it brings to you and how it grows community and grows levels of trust. Gianna, you have something you want to add to that, I can see. Sure, I would just add that um, what research has shown about trust is that people look to indicators of it and become reliant on them. So I mentioned rating systems, for example, and things of that nature. These tend to be, or whether blah blah car is insured by a reputable insurer, or Airbnb is, et cetera, these tend to be the heuristics or the levers, for example, that people look to, to have trust um, overall in the system. And I think that there are actually some dangers in using these heuristics that, that consumers rely on them so heavily. So for example, oh, I'll take this Uber driver because they have a five-star rating as compared to this other driver who has a four-star rating. And in particular, because we're at the Women's Forum, um, what research has shown, for example, is that systematically women drivers in Uber get rated lower than male drivers do. Um, and this is just, you know, uh, and, and within the Airbnb system, for example, if you're a person of color, it's much more difficult for you to actually book a place because people won't accept you as someone to, the, to, a, to as much of an extent as, uh, as, as people uh, who aren't of color. So I would just like to add, I guess, that these heuristics and levers that people use as, as their barometers of trust, there are systematic issues embedded uh, within them. And, and I think it's important to be aware of them and to try and, as you guys, as future business leaders of running, sharing economy at companies, perhaps, um, to think about how you can overcome these in your systems. You know, um, Blah Blah Car actually did quite a comprehensive study on trust of all of its drivers and passengers. It canvassed everybody. And they found um, that while the first transaction may have been one of convenience and saving money, consistent transactions were because of the experience. I mean, but still the underlying basis was that, okay, we're saving money. I don't have a car. I don't want a car. So maybe it's a combination of two. But I've, I have one question for everybody here. Can... Hotels and Airbnb coexist? Can G7 and Uber coexist? I mean, Uber now, drivers all over the world are on strike demanding benefits and higher wages. They, they want to be employees. That's, that's against the business model. I mean, what, what do we see? Well, my view on that is that yes, but there, will, there is a need for adaptation on both sides. So for traditional businesses and incumbent, I think that uh, what could uh, explain the success of Uber, if I take the experience that we had, uh, you know, with some, uh, you know, difficult conversations in, uh, in Canada, is frankly speaking, the service that we were getting from taxi drivers was not, uh, you know, in line with the expectations of consumers. So, so, so you need to adjust. So my view is that for traditional businesses, you need to be close to your customers, you need to be able to innovate, you need to be agile, and you need to adapt. And on the other end, when you look at newcomers uh, like Airbnb and Uber, well, they need to be also respectful corporate citizens, and they need to pay tax, they need to be respectful of people, and that sort of thing. So there is, in my view, an adaptation uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the two. Um, I would like to say just one thing about trust, because my view, trust is the most important thing when you think about an organization, a company, when you think about uh, being a business leader, what you want to do is to create 
trust with your customers, with your people, uh, and, and at the end of the day, that's probably the most important thing in the world. And I think that in this uh, Women for Rob, I hope that we can be all creator of trust because we are missing that, you know, that thing that is so fundamental. So it was a great uh, question and a great point. Danny, you have. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think it's a uh, it's, uh, useful competition and it's, uh, I mean, it's the way uh, uh, capitalism brings value to society. So there is a useful competition. Uh, as far as we're concerned, it puts us on our toes. Uh, and the, the tools, the, the, the rating tools that have, have been invented by the sharing economy, we have decided to adopt because we believe it's a factor of trust. We, we, uh, we have decided as a, as a commitment of, of our company that we would put online the ratings that our customers uh, are giving us. Uh, uh, so we allow our customers to rate us online and we provide those ratings uh, to the other, uh, to the rest of the world. And so this is something that uh, we would not have done on our own if the, those rating systems had not been, been invented by the sharing economy. And so I think I agree with you, uh, the, the sharing economy uh, brings additional competition and it works both ways they, the, 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 with the benefits that uh, Uber driver will eventually get because uh, those benefits are standard in the rest of the industry. It's a new business model entirely. Are there other questions from the audience? This is a bit just, I guess just yes, to ask yes. in terms of the companies. So at the people who share, we work with companies to help them engage and participate in the sharing economy. So we work with lots of traditional companies in you know, insurance and finance and all kinds of retail companies. And actually, you know, to look at it one way, this is about making your business more sustainable mm. because, you know, these, this is about people are choosing to, to live their lives in this way. It's a lifestyle choice and it's growing. And businesses are making decisions now about the future of their companies. And, you know, no, um, no one has a monopoly on the sharing economy, okay? And any company, any business can adapt its business model and benefit from the sharing economy because this is about how you engage with your customers it's about how you co-create it's about how you improve your products and services and one of the kind of interesting consequences of the sharing economy is that traditional businesses are having to up their game so there is a reason now when you when you get into a taxi those taxis are going to be cleaner you're going to get a better service um, because there's greater competition when you go and stay for example in a Marriott hotel there's an in-hotel app saying you can connect with your host and get all kinds of information and this is a good thing because every business can participate this is an open door and it's better for society it's better for business it's better for all of us it's certainly better for the environment we have some time for a, another question from the audience Go to a different, okay. And Thank just you. tell us your name and where you're from, please. Hi, I'm Lynn Hutton and I am from Yukon in Canada. Um, I am very interested in, in our sharing economy. And of course, it's very, very new up in Northern Canada. My question though, and it may not be, it's probably too long, but something that we're not talking about is the regulation. Sure. Um, some, some cities um, over-regulate because they don't want it to come in. Some under-regulate because they understand it's coming. And I'm just wondering if any of you have looked at that. I think you probably have. Well, uh, yes and no. It's a very big question. And I do not uh, pretend to have all the answers. But uh, I guess that um, at the end of the day, uh, if and I will go back to some of the things that have been mentioned by all of us, if you have uh, a service or products that is better connected to the need of the people. You need, you, you cannot resist. You cannot say I will put a barrier. Well, we are talking a lot about walls and fences by those times. Uh, I don't want to make any kind of political comments, but you will understand what I mean. It is difficult to do that. So what we need to do, I think, is to be very open to change to be very open to innovation, because it brings a lot of benefits. But at the same time, I think that the role of governments uh, is to make sure that we are having the same kind of um, uh, footing for everybody to make sure that everybody keeps some sort of honesty into the system and respect of uh, people, law, and some basic regulation. That's the way I would see it. Yeah. But we need to adjust and we need to look forward. 
Den Denny has something. Yes, uh, I, I will talk only about financial services, which is the area I, I know uh, best. Uh, there are essentially two approaches of regulators uh, on that topic. One approach, which is uh, uh, an, an approach which is uh, to try to favor innovation, which is called the sandbox approach. So within certain, uh, within a certain size, uh, the uh, regulator would accept that you uh, try new things in the area of the sharing economy before they regulate you for good. And other approaches that are more traditional would say uh, you are entering the competitive game, you, have, you, you, create, uh, uh, you create a risk to your uh, customers and we uh, financial services regulator need to protect your customer no matter how big the organization is and you apply the regulation from the beginning. Those are the two approaches that coexist and I, will, I won't name the names of the countries that approach, that said, give, take one approach or the other, but the two exist. Yeah, we're just about out of time too, but I mean, further, further to that is, um, I know that there are several cities who are involved in trying to find a, sort of a, an overall regional approach to companies like Airbnb, because they, you know, I know Paris and Amsterdam, for example, because right now they're not getting enough tax benefit and there are too many unhappy people and, and it's crowded. So anyway, we are out of time. I want to thank our panelists, um, Benita Makovska, thank you very much, and Gianna Eckhart, Monique LaRue, and Denny Duverne. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Jillian? Yep. And thank you.